She just couldn't manage it. She said something over where she has to go to the yeah, yeah, so I'll let you know if you yeah. yeah. reinstate yeah. anything. Yeah, it's a really nice group. Yeah. It's a nice way yeah. to yeah. get to know yeah. people. Yeah. 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 I usually yeah. you're in this yeah. at night. Right. Just a few minutes, so if folks want to grab their seats and fill in towards the front, that would be great. <laughs> so <laughs> fill in towards the front. There. Everybody's over there. It's a little, uh, <laughs> you're, you're on the camera nicely for Zoom is the reason. <laughs> However, I can't talk. Can you turn your stool a little bit? Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. There you go. That's better. Yeah, that works great. Let me go back. Oh, gosh. I'm good. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, welcome everyone. We will go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining us this evening on the beautiful University of Redlands Marin campus. Um, for those in person and online, we've got a number of folks. I'm Emily Pellisier. I'm our executive director here at Presidio. Um, we are just thrilled and honored to be back on this campus. And I say back on this campus because our Presidio founder actually helped start Presidio while he was an SFTS student and alum living in the area. So this has really been a big homecoming for our school. And we are so thrilled to be partnering with SFTS um, on this event tonight and hoping to do many more of these collaborations to come. So thank you, Ed, for joining us. And I'm gonna turn it over to John to say a few words. Uh, just wanna say welcome to everyone on behalf of uh, the Dean of San Francisco Theological Seminary, Lori uh, Garrett Cabina. Uh, and the whole staff at SFTS. Um, we're very thrilled to be partnering with Presidio to, to host this talk about business, um, science, and technology, AI, and what I would call at SFTS, spirituality or human uh, values. Um, my name is John Falcone. I teach practical theology at San Francisco Theological Seminary. The person that really pulled this together is Chris Oker, who is our sometime history professor uh, and now working uh, at the GTU, the Graduate Theological Union. Uh, I'd love it, Chris, if you said a few words about how this all came together. Sure. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I am Christopher Oker, and um, I'm sometime because I'm on leave. Grand great. <laughs> Uh, graciously granted by the provost of the University of Redlands to serve as interim dean at the Graduate Theological Union, of which San Francisco Theological Seminary is part. And we and the Presidio Graduate School are uh, both recent uh, recent um, entrants into the University of Redlands. Uh, this campus is now belongs to the University of Redlands. It's the Marin campus of the university. 
this is the first event, I think, the very first event um, that uh, we've organized as a collaboration between Presidio and San Francisco Theological Seminary. So uh, my colleagues on the faculty here are really quite excited about this and really glad to, uh, to uh, basically have a conversation together with the Presidians. Um, We've been, you know, I've had the privilege of getting to know a number of you and visiting uh, various receptions and things that you've done and it's been really a, a wonderful experience. I want to acknowledge Adrian McCormick, the provost of the University of Redlands, who's uh, joining us and, um, and, um, yeah, you. Uh, Tom Horan, uh, <laughs> Dean of the Graduate School of, of of, of business and society at the University of Redlands. Presidio is a, a center institute. What um, I'm not sure. The name it, changes daily. It, it, it's, it's a thing uh, that is embedded in, is embedded in the, uh, in the uh, School of Business and Society. And um, Ron Nazer, who is also joining us, who was the founding provost of uh, the Presidio Graduate School. And uh, so I thank you all for being here. Uh, this, so this event came about when um, we had this idea that we would host a conversation that would uh, you know, be of interest to both uh, the theological students and business students, and also uh, have some really clear, solid connection with um, Rain County and even this town. And some of the amazing things that have happened actually in this neighborhood. And uh, one of the people who was a participant and driver that was, in fact, Ed Cadmo, um, uh, who is a well known figure in the film industry here in the Bay Area and actually around the world. Um, it, it was, can I talk about you a little bit at the risk of making <laughs> mistakes? Please don't point out the mistakes. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Um, but it was Ed as a computer scientist who actually innovated some of the earliest software uh, that is now commonly used in, uh, in animation, uh, which has complete, and, and actually the implications of that, of that um, technology have extended well beyond the film industry. Um, so, you know, in a way, and I'm a historian, and so I'm kind of thrilled to to, and I'm a medieval historian, so most of my people have been dead for a very long time. <laughs> It's quite exciting. I'm working on it. <laughs> I'm glad you're not there yet. Yes, it's quite thrilling for me. So, um, so I, with that introduction, I welcome you. I'm glad that you're here, and I'm thrilled that you're here. Um, we're going to have a conversation, and essentially, um, uh, two members of our community, um, uh, Marsha, Marsha Willard. <laughs> Thank you. Um, who is the director of the faculty in the Presidio School, and Peter Choi, who is a member of the faculty here at SFTS, will um, interview uh, Ed, um, asking some questions, engaging him in a conversation. It's, we've, uh, we've promised Ed that this would be a free and open and casual conversation. And after we've, we've done that for a while, we'll open the floor uh, to um, everyone else. And we'll go at it and enjoy ourselves and conclude that with refreshments, which have been brought into the back. So thank you. And with that, I hand it over to you, Marcia. Thank you. Um, this will come as no surprise to those of you in both communities that when Peter and I were working on how to interview the same person from the two different perspectives, uh, we found a lot of overlap. Um, so we chose three themes that we're going to let and expand on, uh, one around values and one around leading and managing organizations in a disruptive environment. And the third one is just about leadership. Um, and before we do that, we thought we'd spend just a 30 second commercial for why these, how these questions resonate differently in our uh, communities. So thinking about the first one about values in an organization from the Presidian's perspective, uh, we try to imbue our students with the philosophy that all organizations should be values-based and purpose-based uh, and that that's what business should be about. Um, and Peter, you wanna talk about yours perspective on? Yeah, well, I think just generally, um, 
uh, I think so. I'm a historian by training, but I have interest in theology and spirituality. I think the work that I do revolves around a lot around creativity. And I was really pleasantly surprised to discover this book, Ed's book, as a, a deeply, profoundly spiritual book that's attuned to the needs of human society, culture. Um, and so I'm really excited to approach the conversation from that lens. But I think there will be indeed a lot of overlap and intersecting interests here. Yeah, cool. So to kick it off, I'm going to pose the first question to you, Ed. Um, and uh, it was interesting to inter pre-interview you uh, a week or so ago. I'd like you to speak about some things that you said in that meeting about uh, why values are important and how they drive performance and culture of an organization. And, and perhaps also you talked about values inversion and how that happens and how to prevent it. <clears throat> oh, and then Ed, before we're going to sort of sprinkle kind of two perspectives on this, right? Yes, so, okay. so one more additional perspective um, from a kind of theological, spiritual angle here. And I want to do this by um, recounting a story that you tell in the book just briefly. You say this, and I think this might have actually happened in San Anselmo when you were interviewing for Lucasfilm. But you talk about um, being in an interview for this job, and then that you say, the first thing he asked me was who else should Lucasfilm be considering for this job? Um, and being as sharp as you are, you immediately noticed, meaning the job I was there to interview for is this per was this person asking me who else should be considered for this job. And I think this value of embracing competition, because you went on to give a list of names of pe people that you thought would be a great fit for this job. It was so a very <laughs> small, a group of people, several people who had this vision of yeah. developing computer graphics. They wanted to do it, and you know, and each struggling for funding. We, we probably had more funding back in New York than, than the others did, yeah. but each struggling for it. So for George Lucas, who had just come out with Star Wars, to right. ask somebody to come in and run R and D would be like the plum job. Yeah. Okay. So they basically they they went out to find everybody. Yeah. But then this value of like embracing competition, sometimes I think especially in theology and spirituality, one of the things that we wrestle with is uh, uh, not just the oppositional values, but a hierarchy of values. In other words, good values, and you're trying to figure out which ones are better or more important. And so I'm wondering about sort of how you have gone about in your life and work of um, navigating that hierarchy of values, right? So embracing competition on the one hand, but also ensuring your own survival and well-being on the other hand. How, do, how have you navigated that? Well, in that particular case, it wasn't so much uh, embracing competition. It was that, um, it, 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 I, to me, it felt like yeah. I really had to answer their question and be honest with them. And, and told later that was one of the main reasons they hired me was because I was the only person that named everybody else they were talking to, <laughs> and nobody else would give me other names. <laughs> they wanted a job, and uh, and I but I believe in that, and that is um, if you've got the values and you live them, then people will see it. And uh, I, and honestly, uh, there uh, to me, there's a principle that's spread throughout the business. Of course, we were in filmmaking, but a lot of the values in filmmaking aren't explicit. They have to be implicit. Um, because if you hit them in the face with it, then uh, actually people don't listen. But if it's sort of built into the story, then it has uh, greater value and it means more to people. Um, I, um, um, you know, I've been doing this for 50 years, so I've got uh, way too many stories to tell, but uh, recently I've been doing a lot of you know, retrospective thinking about this and in particular thinking about uh, what happens in this rapid change because there's been this drumbeat of exponential change for the last 50 years and over and over again there were companies who could not uh, perceive where this might lead or the implications, even if they were in the technology business. For those of you who are aware of workstations, none of them survived to today. But the information about the rate at which things was going was uh, completely 
known to them. So the question at the time was, why aren't they seeing this? Because we were making decisions based upon the fact that things were going to change dramatically in the future. We don't know how, just like we're, which we're witnessing, we are witnessing this now with AI that's developing. We're still fairly early in this, it's changing pretty dramatically. The only thing that we know is that it is changing and we don't know the full implications. So um, just in, in thinking about this, there's one thing that we have always had to be aware of is that as you've there are a few values you have to have as a company. And almost, if, if not every company would say they have a certain set of values. Um, in fact, if, if you think about what are the things that a company really should do, really should have, um, I would say roughly um, you need to, uh, to make money to survive, right? That's to do that. Uh, we did. Um, the other one is you want to make something which is really good, a good product. Um, and the third one is you want to take care of your people. And uh, most groups would say, well, they're of equal value. The real question is, is which is the actual priority? Not what they say. What do they do? And the it to the extent that one might set some priority to that or even say they're equal, almost all companies would sacrifice the other two for the profit, all right? So that was, was it just trying to wrestle with this, it's like what's going on? And for me, it's an inversion of the values. The value's there, it's the inversion. And it actually follows from the other two. And basically business schools have taught this for a long time. You make a good product, product come from having really good people, you get that right, the other will happen. If you get all right, you have to think about the different aspects of it. But it's really easy to get derailed from that. So the question is, why do people get derailed? And I know this is maybe an ab abstract way of, of thinking about it, but if you put money, let's say, in the bank at, at a certain interest, um, sorry, where you, you have it in some sort of investment fund, then at that point, you uh, are judging whether or not this is actually doing well for you. So the fact that number now is an easy number and it's abstracted out from whatever happens underneath to make it a reality. Now, in, in our modern system, one of the problems is that the, the, the shareholders and the others are interested in the short-term economic gain. So it distorts the system. So the pressure on the people, even though they say have the values, is they're going to lose their job if they don't actually meet that one. So there's something that's uh, you know, disturbing about it, and it takes a great deal of personal strength on the part of the leader to be able to actually not let that distort what they're doing. Um, there are companies that do it. I've seen companies um, that are, are able to hold those things in their head, the long-term and the short-term. And, uh, and you know, Steve Jobs bought us from Lucasfilm, and initially he was you know, on the wrong side of this, but he learned a lesson. That's, I mean, that self as a story is, is, the, is the hero's journey that he went through and the result was when he came back, he actually figured out how to maintain the balance and how to make decisions for the long term. Um, so there's, you know, I could ramble on about this, but I do think there's something about not agreeing that value is important because everybody will say, of course it's important. It's important for a business. Your quality is important. It's what are your actions that actually say, I really value the people, how they work together, and they were looking at what we're making, and if they're valued, they feel ownership in what they're making. And if they feel ownership in it, it's going to be better, because that ownership means they want it to be good. So I know I, at Pixar, I was recently looking through some old mails because I was missing a year of my log of my history, trying to 
reconstruct it. I don't know what happened to it. Um, and uh, but reading through these emails, and man, we were like a squabbling family. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing I liked about it was that uh, if I did something where they didn't think was right, I was called on it. And I felt good about that because what it meant was they cared about what we were doing. And so somehow that squabbling felt like, man, we were, we were a lively family. I mean, they weren't opposed to each other, but they felt ownership in what we were doing and what we were doing. And if, if they didn't like the film they were making on, they would say so, because this needs to be good. And it gave us a, this incredibly long history because they wanted, that, that value was the most important thing to them. That's actually a really helpful transitional thought for the next question, which is, um, well, I'll set it up this way. You are a computer scientist by training and an animator, according to the authoritative source that is Wikipedia. <laughs> but you have found yourself uh, often in, your, in the course of your work life managing people. So this next question is, what have you learned about managing people, especially uh, in the midst of tumultuous, disruptive times when, um, when even questions around what harm means can be different for different people? And I'll invite Marsha to kind of texture that question. Um, yeah, I, I was intrigued by, I mean, you were in an industry, as you mentioned, is one of the fastest changing industries, has huge implications. Uh, and you also alluded to the fact that some, even in the industry who knew that the change was rapid, still hung on to past successes and were not willing to let go or, you know, driven by the sunk cost philosophy that I put too much into this, it must be the best <coughs> to succeed. And, what a, you know, leading in that kind of volatile, changing atmosphere, staying open enough to being grasping the new things without tanking your company. <laughs> well, I was uh, I was fortunate. So I went to the University of Utah and had a um, my first two teachers were later Turing Award winners for different reasons, who taught important lessons. Um, and the, the computers, of course, were not very capable at the time, which meant we had to essentially emulate the future. So it, was, it took a long time to make a picture, but we were making it. Uh, this is the, the mindset to begin with is, oh, the computers can't do it now, but if we emulate it, because a computer can emulate itself in a slower version, so it might take an hour to make a picture. Uh, don't worry about that because it's going to get faster. So we're just thinking about what futures are going to be, knowing that this is changing in unpredictable ways. But the, the most important thing when I left was that I loved that environment I was in. And I, as I left, I thought, I want to maintain that, and be in that kind of environment for the rest of my life. So that became a, a driving factor for me, was how do I have that kind of environment, supportive, um, and it's just, and, and so forth. So um, I went out to New York. So now at the age of, I don't know, 30 or something like that, um, I was a manager for the first time in my life. Did not know what in the world I was doing. And because I wanted to have this environment, um, I came up with some theories about how to do it. And uh, some of the theories were worked very well. Um, as I mentioned, there were other people that one had, had the same goal, but they were very secretive. They thought if, if they came up with this sort of secret thing, they would, um, you know, they could actually get a lock on what on solving this problem. From my point of view, we were so far away that that made no sense whatsoever. So instead, we completely engaged with our community, the graphics community, which was new. And we published everything we did. Now, originally it was, we wanted to publish everything we did because we also wanted the best people to come to us. And we were essentially drawing from an academic group and academics would prefer to publish. 
So if we say we're going to publish everything we do, they're more likely to say, oh, we'll join you. At this point, I'm on Long Island. So this is not one of the, the, the centers of drawing people in to the computer world. <laughs> so we just, we thought about <clears throat> what it meant to engage with the community and, and, and have them in turn believe they're part of this long-term vision. And uh, it worked really well. Um, at the end of the five years, I should say when I started, I thought of myself as an academic who happened to be given this opportunity to be in charge, but I didn't want to be a manager. My, I mean, honestly, I kind of like the idea of being in charge, but I didn't want to spend time and I knew nothing about it. So I had these theories. One of the theories was I got a complete flat organization uh, and I was only going to hire people who are um, uh, self-motivated. So that was my theory. So I get into this I, and I realize, oh, wait a minute, this is complete nonsense. I can't tell that people are self-motivated. <laughs> <laughs> the other one was, there are a lot of people who are really brilliant. They just need motivation. <laughs> so uh, it was to realize, oh, actually, this is interesting too. Like, I really like solving the technical problems, but this is an interesting problem. So managing isn't like this, uh, you know, like you learn these things to do it because there are certain things you do need to know as a manager, but, but it was interesting. And that was important to me. It wasn't about being in, really being in charge. It was about this, like solving this problem because these are people working together. So at the end of the five years, uh, because we had done a, a good job and also I was honest with George uh, and I attract these really good people and George had me come here. When I came here, uh, I, uh, to, to some extent, I was relieved of the screw-ups that I had made. That is, my, some of my theories backed me into a corner and I didn't have enough skill to get out of the corner I backed into. So when I came here, it's kind of like a do-over, but I also looked back and said, okay, about half of my theories worked very well and half were a complete crock. <laughs> so uh, I, I believed at the time as I came here was that that ratio of half right and half wrong would continue there at Lucasfilm or would probably continue for the rest of my life. <laughs> uh, now, in truth, it isn't the kind of thing you can measure easily. But I think the real value for me personally was to understand that I would be wrong more than I thought I would be. Um, so it was just like working this out. And over time, uh, this became um, a more important thing to me because there are so many good people there that the best thing I can do is to actually create the environment to let them flower in essence, that's what George did for me. He created the environment and he let us be open. And now, uh, you know, having learned from the past is, okay, how do we get better at what we're doing? And interestingly enough, when Steve bought us, Steve is notoriously secretive. He never questioned my decision to publish everything we did because he understood we were doing something different. This was about building a community. So this group had a really tight focus as we went through some really hard times uh, when Pixar was starting. We actually, uh, you know, we, didn't, we failed as a hardware business, as a software business. We were just trying to hang on because that exponential curve hadn't reached the point where it was economical to make a film. Um, but we were building relationships. So when it finally got to the point where it was possible, we had already developed a relationship with Disney. And uh, they said, well, we'd like you to try to do some project for us. You know, the, that film, which they pursue, perceived of as a boutique film. They didn't think that Toy Story would be anything more than a small film, <laughs> but this is our chance. And, uh, but the team around it, 
um, had this ethic about how they, they support each other and the value of what they wanted to do. So it was pretty remarkable, but it was years in the building to get to the point where we could start. <laughs> do you think that <clears throat> the humility that you went in with, the admitting that you're wrong half the time, gave permission for a lot of experimentation and creativity to flourish because it made it okay? You made it okay for them to make mistakes. Uh, yeah, it was a... Uh... Came a, 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 an important principle for us is we had very few rules, and uh, we always wanted somebody who would do something uh, unusual or unlikely. The only rule which people understood was you can't hurt people, either you know through words or through uh, any other sort of action. But other than that, uh, we had people doing some pretty strange things. Um, Can you give some examples? <laughs> well, um, uh, let's see, what are the strange examples? Let's see. Well, one of them was, it was, it was uh, Eddie Newton, he just the weirdest <laughs> sort of guy that was down outside the bathroom in a tuxedo and hand out towels as people went in. <laughs> <laughs> Um, then also a lot of the, the more these sort of social events were not organized top down, they were organized bottom up, which meant that it was important that they do things where they did not have to ask for permission. Say, I've got an idea, they would just do it. Um, and uh, the uh, I mean, one example was in the building once they they thought it'd be a good idea if they had a put together a truck in the middle of the animation area. So over the, the weekend, they dismantled the truck, brought it in, you know, we came in and there's this truck in the middle of their area. <laughs> and, uh, so the key thing, and Jim Morris was there at the time also, was, was we never said a word because we didn't want even want people to think that they had asked permission. We actually want people to understand that they did it. Um, I believe that, first of all, you can't get any work done if everybody does crazy stuff. We all know that. So normally what happens is you don't want a bunch of crazy stuff, there's crazy stuff going on, you want to get work done. But I think that's the wrong approach. The right approach is that since a very small number want to do it, if you have a few people doing things that are really right at the edge, then you're giving a signal to everybody that the tent's pretty broad. Mm -hmm. And you want that signal. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was one time once where uh, there was, it was the It Gets Better campaign. Um, you know, uh, there was, I don't know, and then I forget when it started. But uh, the, the group of people, uh, you know, the LBGTQ, whatever the letters are, uh, community, decided to make one. So they interviewed all these people and they, 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 pre they put together a really nice thing from people at Pixar talking about it. And uh, but the, they realized, oh, they're about to do it on the internet. So they'd already made this without anybody knowing. So, the woman who was leading it came and said, uh, before releasing the internet, um, you, we probably should show this to you. And but they never asked. And I said, that's really nice. Because so, I didn't want them to think they ever had asked permission to do something which is good. And then, uh, and I never even told Disney we were going to release it, so we just did it. <laughs> <laughs> but I just, you know, I don't like a bunch of rules because usually if somebody violates a rule, a, a a norm, really, a, 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 a rational norm. The better thing is to address the particular problem, not to actually put together a rule for everybody else. All well, these big, thick manuals that companies have to protect the company, it's like, you know, it's just, it's like a, a blanket on top of being creative and open and so forth. <laughs> Three? <laughs> 
Well, we, we kind of bled into this. It's about what it takes to become a great leader. And I we kind of prompted you a little bit in that last one about what kind of culture you create when you're willing to admit that you're wrong. But you also talked um, the other week about creating a culture that allowed people to flourish. And I think some of what you said speaks to that. Hold that thought, because if you have other thoughts on it, it would be interesting to hear. Which is... Yeah, so okay, one of the things that you write, I think, in the revised um, edition of the book is you say that at its heart, Creativity Inc., that's the book title, was my attempt to illuminate how each of us, but particularly leaders, can think about creating a culture that allows people to flourish. I think it's a wonderfully beautiful language about um, helping, seeking the good of everybody um, that you are working alongside of. And I wonder if you could just describe how you have gone about doing that work, uh, especially in the face of obstacles. I mean, in, at its heart, this is a question about what it was like to work with Steve Jobs, who I think he, you, you write in the book that one of the first conversations you had with him, he told you he was going for your job, right? <laughs> um, and you embraced that opportunity anyway. And so what was that like? And, and what, what has leadership looked like for you in the course of uh, working with so many different, you know, a really rich cast of characters in your life? Well, in, in the case of uh, Steve, he got through a fairly public humiliation when he was kicked out of Apple in 1985. And, uh, uh, he'd, and I had just been introduced to him by Alan Kay, who was one of those Turing Award winners who was grad, a grad student at Utah when I was there. And, uh, and then Steve disappeared, and the reason he disappeared was that he was off in this internal battle, which ultimately led to his being dismissed. And, and then he came back to us and, and uh, proposed buying us because Lucasfilm was selling that division. And um, so Steve was interested in buying it. And he put down the, in the proposal what he wanted, and we met with him down at his... Uh, house in uh, Redwood City and uh, uh, basically he wanted us to become the core of uh, a computer company which would complete, compete with Apple so we declined <laughs> so we came back and spent the next year year in hell um, trying to find funding um, and uh Basically, we, we found it. So the General Motors and Phillips Medical agreed to buy us. And uh, then the week before the deal was signed, it turns out General Motors had an internal war between the EDS people and the car people. So every deal was tanked. So now we're back to square one again. Yes. And I ran into Steve and he already formed his computer company. So now he was interested in buying us terms of what we wanted to do. Um, so, and that was in 1986 that happened. I wonder, when I first knew Steve, he was the kind of person that, um, that you know, that, I mean, there was a reason why he was kicked out of Apple, just in terms of the behavior. And I didn't think he was very empathetic and he didn't understand um, people who were didn't have powerful personalities. So uh, those are rough times to begin with. Um, but over the course of the next few years, um, I should say one thing. When he formed as a company, Steve put his arms around uh, Howie Ray Smith, the other co-founder, and said, whatever happens, we have to be loyal to each other. Uh, the reason he said this, of course, is he'd just been kicked out of Apple. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't want, he, he wanted a sort of agreement, like us be loyal to each other. But in fact, he was, as we went through struggles, and his own company was struggling. So uh, basically, we're all a mess. Nobody knew what we we're doing. <laughs> and, uh, but we had, in the process, we had a contract with Disney, and we had nurtured that relationship very well. It's a software contract. But we were also making these uh, short films and later commercials 
that were winning a lot of awards. So, um, uh, and they made no money for Pixar whatsoever. <coughs> Purely to, you know, part of bringing in good people and and just desperately hanging on to this, the vision that we wanted. And as a result of Disney's success with their animated film, <coughs> also because they had success with the uh, I'm Ever for Christmas, which is made in San Francisco, I was stop frame animation. It was successful, but it was a small film. And they referred to it as a, as a boutique film. And they thought that computer animation would be a boutique film. It wouldn't cost them very much money. So we entered into a, a relationship to make uh, the first film, which was Toy Story. Uh, now, in the process of going through this, uh, Steve has now had two failures along the way, big ones. One was Next really wasn't working. And the first version of Pixar didn't work. We had actually did a reforming of the company at one time, sold the hardware business, but then making commercials until this happened. So essentially, uh, he'd had no commercial success. So we started Toy Story in 91, it was released in 95. When Toy Story was released, uh, with, we went public the week after. So in this period from 91 to 95, um, Steve, well, 91, he got married. His son, Reed, was born. Um, the, the film industry, which had been very anti-technology for a while, went through within a short period of time a major transformation across digital editing um, and with uh, text and computer graphics using our software. So all this happened in this period of time. By the end of that period of time, then Steve had gone through a rather radical transformation. Uh, and it's that's why I refer to his hero's journey. Like he's cast out of his kingdom, he wanders around <laughs> and, and struggles and has problems and failures. Steve was really smart and he was learning from each one of these things. And by the end of this period, he was a transformed person. Uh, I didn't think people could learn to be empathetic. They did. Uh, the way he interacted with people changed. He was still smart, uh, incredibly smart, uh, very strong personality, but um, he, he changed. And the people who were with him at that time stayed with him for the rest of his life. It's because they stayed with him the rest of his life that when the official biography was written, about him, it was an authorized biography. Nobody who was uh, nobody would actually give the 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 full, the full details, like psychoanalyzing Steve when he's still alive. So the writers, a good writer, completely missed the more important story was that transformation of somebody learning from their mistakes. And uh, <laughs> just to give you an example. There are actually two examples of the way Steve thought. One of them was, for 10 years, Pixar was a public company with the board of directors. There were two members of the board of directors who Steve fired. The reason he fired them was they never disagreed with him. And he said, if they, if they never disagree with me, then they don't actually add anything to what we need. So that's not the normal way <clears throat> CEOs think about their board of directors. Um, so, um, you know, it's rather, you know, it, be, it, be, it became an emotional thing for me because of this change in his life. The other was he really understood the change in technology. Unlike the other companies which were wedded to the model they had, he said the, the, Computers have sort of reached the limit of what they're going to do. And the computers are going to be so fast and so small that now is the time to, to develop a smartphone. The groundwork was laid by other industries. That is, technology was only getting smaller 
telecom companies were all trying to do that. There are Blackberries and various sorts of phones. And uh, there was one event, Steve was showing us the secret phone and we're on the bridge going over to the secret lab. And he, he said, I said, but, but, but he said, the problem is that most people hate their phones. I want to make a phone that people love. Okay, so he actually succeeded. Had this downside though. <laughs> but it's like every major change like that, you um you you could predict the upside to it. It's hard to predict the downside. Anyway, I can I could start well, you wondering. Didn't, you didn't say this, and to your credit, I don't, I don't think you were even trying to imply this, but I wonder if part of his transformation was the presence of people like you in his life who had a value for flourishing as well, um, I mean, I'd like to think that, we, that the, the company as a whole, because we had a whole group of people who were like that. I do think that we also improved his sense of humor. Um, <laughs> because he was, I'd say when I first learned, he wasn't, he didn't have a lot of humor. <laughs> but when he returned to Apple, he'd actually learned the value of, <clears throat> of uh, humor, and he would use it a lot more. And, but he did it in a way that was natural for him. Yeah, let's open it up to the audience to have questions for, or reactions to this. How, how you, when you described, was there a cause and effect that you became public right after Toy Story? Was something in the time you tell? Oh. Oh, well, yes, I mean, there was, absolutely, there was. Yeah, so can you take us through your, your thought process? Yeah, well, the, the uh, uh, we were, um, we were a separate company, uh, with Steve being majority share, uh, or shareholder of it. But we had a three picture contract with Disney. So we came and, and we knew ultimately this is what we would probably do, but we thought we should, wait, we should have a few successes under our belt. But Steve said, and this is part of his, his analytic mind at the time, he said, this film is going to be much bigger than Disney thinks, and, which we all believed. And uh, that, because Disney didn't believe it to begin with, that's why there were almost no toys for the first movie. Because... <laughs> Nobody thought it was gonna be big. Um, so he said, it's going to be big. We have to make two more films for them. And at the end of the two films, Michael Eisner will realize that he has just created his worst nightmare. It was right, right? Because <laughs> they were starting to go downhill and we were on this trajectory up. He said, at which point, uh, Michael's going to want to renegotiate this. The first thing they thought was to have Disney as the distributor of films is actually very good. They do know how to market films. But our financial deal for that first film was really terrible. Like it was, it was so terrible, we actually wouldn't survive very well. So bad. So he said he's going to want to renegotiate, but if we uh, uh, when we negotiate with them, we have to do it as equal partners. Incidentally, that's a change in Steve. He would always like shoot for the big one, like shoot, shoot for everything. And uh, I'd say in the course of, of running Next Computer, he did some things which were just, he got a lot of short-term gain, gain for some things. Uh, uh, well, what, one example was, he's got this new operating system on Next, he said the operating system that was on next is what's in your watch and your your <laughs> your, your your cell phone now, or if you have an iPhone. Um, but he had this operating system which you can develop. But he wanted more money for the company, so he signed a licensing deal with IBM. Now this is actually a brilliant move, so he can make have IBM make this be a standard for them. It would then become a really important operating system. But he got a little too greedy and uh, he uh, 
wanted them to pay $100 million for the, the license to the software, but they didn't have the right to subsequent um, uh, upgrade the operating system, that's subsequent versions oh. of it. Now, I was just looking at, looking at it thinking, well, first of all, that was really a bad move on Steve's part because he wanted to be the operating system. He's got to have it so that they have a long-term success on it. So that was a bad decision on his part. The other was, what moron at IBM thought this is a good idea <laughs> to have some software and not get right to the ongoing versions of it? It's like it was, you know, anyway. <laughs> Obviously, that's a bad idea, but it happened. <laughs> And then there was one other thing like that where they got a lot of money in the short term and it turns out not to have been a long-term benefit for them. So now, having learned from those, we get to this one and it said, we have to approach this as equal partners. And if we're equal partners and have equal ownership in it, then we have to put up half the money. We don't have half the money. So we need to go public in order to get the money so that we can... Uh, uh, put up our half of making the film. And uh, my reaction was, uh, it seems, still seems a little early. And he said, no, trust me on this. Okay. So he was right. So we went public. It was uh, uh, one of the largest IPOs of the year. Escape went public the same year. In fact, I think of all the top 10 companies went public, only two are still <laughs> um, but it was, uh, uh, we then had that cash, cash influx put in the, the bank then. And then sure enough, three months later, Michael Eisner came along and wanted to renegotiate the deal. And at this point, for Steve, it was, okay, we're equal partners on this. And of course, Michael Eisner didn't like that because they had a great deal before. But in the end, Steve could hold on to this moral ground of saying, we're partners. We're both in this. So that's what uh, they signed into. And so that started the relationship. And um, our personal relationships within the various groups that Disney was one that we worked on and cherished and valued. And, and, uh, and all that led to ultimately... Um, Disney deciding to buy us. A question in the back right there. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Josh Presidio. Thanks so much for coming. Um, I think when we're trying to invent the future, we have to tell ourselves positive stories about what that future might be. And I think it, at Pixar, obviously, it's a great example of inventing in a whole lot of different ways, but including also really positive narratives, I feel like. I think in the current culture, the stories that we're telling each other about the future are, tend to be fairly negative, <laughs> either on the entertainment side with, for example, I don't know, 90% of all sci-fi is dystopian in my, <laughs> in my personal opinion. Or when it comes to the climate crisis, we're also telling each other stories constantly about how dangerous and dire the future could be. And I'm wondering if this is actually hurting us from a creativity standpoint. Like, is this impacting our ability to imagine solutions at, on, a like, on a societal level? And I'm just curious to hear if you have any thoughts or any insight on that. Well, I think it, in, in terms of the environment, for instance, I, I know that uh, in a large number of in, in many places, many universities, um, they because they don't have a, let's say, some sort of economical best interest which is stored in them, they know that we're in a, in a really scary place um, and that it, it is bad. So, um, but there's something that's a, a little screwy in terms of the fear that's uh, getting in the way of seeing it, as well as this again comes down to the money is that certain companies actually value making the profit than they do over the lives of their grandchildren. Uh, or now it turns out to the lives of their children. 
um, it's uh, it was always one of these baffling things. Like, what's going on with these people? You should, like, I don't understand it. Um, and so part of this wrestling recently, a lesson is an older question is like, why can't they see this? I mean, the seventies, as is fifty years ago, it was clear that we had a problem coming, and uh, so. Uh, so essentially, people have learned out how to gain public awareness in order to prevent anything from being done. Uh, but the number of people with high values who would like to solve the problem is actually quite substantial. But there isn't a nurturing environment for them. Instead, uh, we've got, if anything, this more induced fear. And one of the problems with these uh, these certain kinds of problems is that um, as the environment changes, there are more uh, events that will happen that cause instability. So people crossing borders, uh, uh, heat, flooding, and so forth will cause more instability, which will cause people to want to, uh, if anything, become more reactionary in order to stop it. All right. But without realizing that, that it comes from something that's been building for a very long period of time. So that's uh, w w when you get down to the societal question of what is it that's causing the fear? Because if you look at what's taking place in this country with the, the divisiveness, like there's one part of it which is just mind boggling. Like, I don't understand it. I never thought this would have happened that we get so off kilter. Um, but I do understand that it's a representation of an underlying fear and that, uh, uh, let's see, well, I, it, these are things you all know. So uh, I, one way to look at it is, uh, I'm not, I'm reaching here, but because I think a lot about exponential events for most people, exponential just means fast. But it, it's, and, and the reason it doesn't mean much to most people is because, is because they're not mathematically trained about what exponential means. And, and it's not something that our brains intuit. We don't have a natural understanding of exponential, even though it's been around for a long time, but it doesn't happen in ways that people are aware of it. So for instance, when fruit goes bad, it goes bad quickly. All right, that's an exponential event. The other is the spread of disease. But another example would be, the reason I'm bringing this up is that if you get, let's say a flu or you know, COVID or some, other, some disease like that, um, you've got uh, mechanisms in your body to protect you from disease. You've got your skin, you've got things in your blood for you know, keeping the wrong stuff out. Then you've got things in your cell to keep the wrong things out. So those are like your natural ongoing mechanism. But every once in a while, a virus will come along that can evade those. And then it starts an exponential growth in the body. At this point, because the body doesn't have anything for it, when it recognizes something is wrong, then your body then starts to build something to combat it. It's not coming from behind because this exponential event has started in your body. Your body then has to respond at a faster exponential rate in order to catch up with the disease. If it catches up, you live. If it doesn't, you die. <laughs> okay, so we are now uh, having sort of like the real-time equivalent of like, these things have been building slowly over time regardless of warnings, whatever, fever warnings that were there 50 years ago, they've been building. And now in order to do something, we have to catch up. The question is, is our mechanism for catching up enabled or is it inhibited? And I believe, because we don't have a great deal of time left, is that we've got kind of the right kind of environment and support then there's a lot we can do. I mean, a lot of the damage, of course, is done, as we know. Um, but that's, for me, it's part of thinking about that sort of compound change is to say, in terms of our society, what do we do to make people creatively solve this? 
because there are so many people who actually do recognize it. When you go to any university, research environments across the world, they know there's a problem. So what enables them? How do we do it? How do we change our society to enable? Right. Peter says two more questions. Go in front and then Scott. Hi, uh, my name is Wesley and I, I wanted to ask how have the values of Pixar impacted the kind of stories that you've decided to tell in your movies and shorts? Well, for the shorts, um, they are, you, you just think people sometimes they just decide they want to do something like some of our shorts, like the group just decide they want to do it. But in general, um, we have them, they don't make any money for the company, um, but they are these great experiences for people. Uh, they're also signals to the outside world that we do things like that. Um, so that's the short program. For the feature films, uh, maybe the only studio that never looks at uh, outside scripts. I mean, we look at the script to get writers, but but we want the stories to come from inside. Um, so we, we ask people to do something and then we, we want something to come from them. So then the question to begin with was, how do we listen to story from people that we already believe, we don't know for a fact, but we believe are going to be good storytellers. Um, and so the thing we, we started was that we ask a person that we want to be a, a director to take a year and come up with three different ideas they'd like to make into a film. And the reason for three ideas is that, as you know, when you're in school, you've got a problem to solve. Sometimes you get your stuck, start banging your head against the wall. So you say three, because as soon as you get stuck, switch the other idea. And then you, you go back and forth between the three. The whole purpose was to keep them from getting stuck. So at the end of the year, they pick their, uh, their three ideas. The same thing happens every time. Now, they witness other people do this. So there's nothing secret about this process. We know this is why we're doing the three. And uh, you're going to pitch the three. And they've been on the other side just watching other people do this. But it starts off the same time. Um, they're going to pitch the three ideas, and they start off by saying, I love all three ideas equally. Now, they're all lying. <laughs> <laughs> so when they pitch them, we don't actually select the idea that we think is the best. Our discussion is, which one do they really want to do? Because they're going to commit the next four years of their life to making this work, and it's going to change so dramatically for whatever this pitch was. If that first pitch doesn't matter, what does matter is whether or not they're really committed to making this happen. And so then we go through this hard, laborious process. And, and every film has a different story. It's very traumatic for some people. Not every director can do it. So sometimes the director uh, will get replaced because they lose their team. But when they're working on a film, they got a team of people. And since the ideas all suck at, at the beginning, they just don't work. If they did, we'd be done. They don't. <laughs> so we can't judge it based on whether or not it's working. The only judge that we have is whether or not the team is functioning well. So the only thing that the director can't do is they cannot lose that team of people. And in, in some of those cases, like the Ratatouille is an example where the concept of it was pitched by one man. Uh, the design was his. It's a wonderful, uh, lovely person. Just couldn't solve it. And then the team uh, uh, lost their confidence since we brought in Brad Bird to then uh, finish the film. Um, Adam Bird lived out in Fairfax. <laughs> no, excuse me, Wood, Woodacre. Mm -hmm. Right, Woodacre. Um, and uh, 
Brad agreed to do it, but he agreed to do it on the terms that he would not be named as the director of the film. They didn't think that was right to do it. Steve and John Lasseter said, whoa, wait a minute. We, we won't let him do it if he won't accept the title because we need him to be listed as the director. So I said to them, I said, well, number one, if Brad doesn't take it over, we're screwed because the team has lost their confidence. But the other one is, I know, Brad, and I guarantee you that when the film comes out, he will want his name on as the director. <laughs> and the top, they said, okay, well, we'll go with that. So, so we met Brad's condition and the topic never came up again ever and Brad was the director. <laughs> but it, you know, because people have to own it. And so really what you want is for the people and the team to feel like it's theirs. And what we want is for people to find something that's in their lives, uh, not to go, they can, they're, they're pretty versed in films and in storytelling and so forth. But if all they're doing is drawing things that work from other films, then it's derivative. So they have to go out and find something that they didn't know or none of us knew. Like Ratatouille is an example of where the research they had to do was to go out to uh, the, the great restaurants in France. Some research <laughs> uh, projects are harder than others. <laughs> but they then put things in the, in the movie, um, which people wouldn't necessarily know. There's, we cook at home, uh, we watch Cooking Channel, but we don't know what it's like to be in a three-star restaurant kitchen. So they were trying to capture the essence and put that in there. And even if people didn't know whether that was true, they would sense that it's true. And that's what you want is the sort of like the sense of something which is real. And then when you get the thing that's real, then you actually get something which is deeper. Because mm -hmm. the film is about the love of art. Which meant that they had to love the art they were doing. How that then come through on this the whole notion of the love of cooking or the love of, of art. All right, we promised Scott the opportunity to bring home. Um, you talk a lot about the creation of a team and even went so far as to say you guys were a family at Pixar and um, I'm just curious about how you look for the right people that are going to take care of each other and when you're going through hiring or if somebody clearly needs some help to become a part of that sort of team, um, what your methods are in terms of looking for those characteristics in people or encouraging them. Well, for a number of them, they're in there. So we are, if, they're, if they're given that kind of opportunity, that we pretty much know who they are, um, you know, as, as a person. As I mentioned, not all of them actually can really direct though. That's even though they're standing right next to somebody, that it's not the same thing as actually holding the position. It actually alters your reality. You have the title. That's true, incidentally, in the leadership in, in companies. And as people are, are given the opportunity to rise to a position and uh, for some people one of the things they that they falter at is that um, they have an image of what it means to be a leader and they uh, and they're not behaving the way they imagine it to be so the first task is to realize that forget what you thought it should be if you keep judging yourself by what you imagined it was like to be CEO or, or a leader, and you'll fail. You have to say, what do I need to do to get it, to get it done? So there's this perception, a, a mental self-perception that some people are able to adapt to and some aren't because they keep judging themselves. And uh, so I just, it's a phenomenon that happens. The other phenomenon is uh, some people are just interested in position and so forth. And, and they're the least likely to do well. 
I mean, do well commercially, mm -hmm. but it's not the kind of person we would want. Um, we have time for refreshments and informal conversation. And so we'd love to just invite you to stick around for that. The last thing I want to say is before we thank Ed is the book is Creativity Inc. The second edition came out last year. And I was just telling him before the event tonight, I think it has really important things to say to a diverse range of wide audiences. So buy the book, read it. Mm -hmm. I think you will enjoy it. Uh, but let's take a moment to thank Ed. My pleasure being here. Thank you. Thank you, Mark.